our panel today really is, is looking at the kind of progress that we're attempting to make and hopefully are making in the area of uh, space sustainability um, and, and to continue the work of last year's summit in, in looking at uh, the large volume of work that remains to be done. Natalia, what is the status of the discussions on space sustainability at the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space? Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, and thank you, Michael, uh, for having me here on this panel. Uh, just before I start, um, uh, uh, just to say that I'm speaking here on my own behalf uh, and that my views may not engage my government. Thank you. Well, the stages of the discussion uh, um, on the long-term sustainability at COPWAS uh, is the following. Uh, we had uh, last year um, a milestone uh, moment as uh, the COP was agreed on 21 guidelines on the long-term sustainability of outer space activities um, that it had been working on uh, for 10 years. And you can imagine 97 member states having to agree per consensus on every single word uh, of those 21 guidelines and the preamble, by the way. Uh, so it was a, a great achievement, uh, also because at the same time, COPOS uh, decided to pursue work on the long-term sustainability by establishing a new working group uh, to, with a five-year mandate uh, to uh, work uh, on, uh, on three elements. And the first is the implementation of those just agreed 21 guidelines. Uh, the second is capacity, capacity building, which will help in the implementation of the guidelines. And the third element is addressing new challenges to outer space activities. So uh, that was last year, uh, those decisions were endorsed by the General Assembly of the United Nations. And this year, uh, the scientific and technical subcommittee uh, started addressing, uh, started uh, actually did an attempt to launch the work of this new working group. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, member states could not agree on the composition of the bureau leading uh, this group. So, um, that is uh, unfortunately the stages and then uh, uh, of course the COVID pandemia uh, broke out around the world and the sessions of the legal subcommittee of COPWAS and of COPWAS itself in June had to be cancelled. So unfortunately the multilateral discussion had uh, are, have been stopped since uh, February. That is the status for now, Michael. Well, thank you, uh, Natalie. Uh, I, I think uh, it would be interesting to hear from uh, Dan about uh, the work that they're doing in trying to provide private sources of data about what's going on in orbit that can be part of these discussions. What's, what's uh, your update, uh, Dan? Yeah, Michael, thank you. And uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, and I'd like to take just a minute and uh, thank the Secure World Foundation for hosting this event. So. You know, the space industry is going through a once in a lifetime change and focusing on sustainability, keeping the focus there is absolutely critical. So it's an honor to participate here. Um, you know, as kind of a, a way of getting into Leo Labs uh, activities, you know, I want to start by saying one of the most impressive aspects of this conference is really the breadth of interested parties. You know, we have UN policymakers, we have regulatory leads, we have space agencies, scientific uh, entities and commercial firms like Leo Labs uh, and the defense community too. And we're all here to talk about sustainability. And the big question is why? And I'd say that the two reasons are first, we all sense we're on the verge of something big, something unprecedented. It's really, it's kind of nothing less than the expansion of human civilization and infrastructure into space, starting with Leo. Uh, and the second is, we're here because we know there are risks that come with this change, and we know they're not well understood. And 2020 looks to be the tipping point for all of these activities. So, uh, you know, at Leo Labs, the big thing that we're doing is addressing the lack of data about all of these risks. So Leo Labs is the commercial space situational awareness and space traffic safety platform for Leo. Uh, we've developed a radar technology 
that we can deploy very quickly. Uh, and in fact, our latest radar I'm showing here in the background, it's the Kiwi Space Radar that we opened up uh, last year in New Zealand. Uh, we have a, a radar, a similar radar in Costa Rica uh, that's underway. We're in the middle of construction and we expect to get the number up to six uh, over the next year or so. So we're on uh, building number four right now. So this is truly a unique data source and it's designed to track a small debris down to two centimeters in size uh, because that debris is a critical element of space sustainability. Um, and on top of that, the, um, the other aspect we're doing is a software platform and using that to report on uh, important events in space. So, you know, simply generating radar measurements isn't enough. So satellite operators, regulators, defense organizations, insurance underwriters, they all need to know what's actually going on in LEO. They need to know the risks. So we operate a, a cloud-based platform that turns the radar measurements into alerts and analytics and real-time reports. Um, so in terms of us, uh, kind of milestones we had earlier this year, we launched our commercial collision avoidance service. Uh, it's responsive, it supports reporting to all stakeholders. Uh, we also completed a rendezvous and proximity operations service, and we're supporting some of these new launches, some of these rideshare launches. Um, we've used this, these capabilities to publicly report on a few events. Uh, including a risky conjunction involving two derelict satellites, uh, a breakup of an H-2A rocket body, a new debris from the Resers-01 satellite, and some rapid tracking of some of these rideshare launches. So, you know, we, what we see in the market is there's a lack of data about what's going on in space, and we're there to fix that. Uh, and so that's, that's what Leo Labs has been up to. Well, thanks a lot, and that I think segues pretty nicely into a question for uh, Joe. Uh, uh, the difference in some cases between a derelict satellite being a piece of debris and uh, a functioning satellite could be on-orbit servicing, and uh, you know a little bit about that. So why don't you uh, give us uh, a sense of, of what your work is doing to contribute to uh, space sustainability? You're on mute, Joe. And uncover my mute button, sorry about that. So thanks, Mike, appreciate that. And, and yeah, absolutely. Uh, we started a, a new industry in space and satellite servicing this year. Uh, in February, nor, uh, our Northrop Grumman built Mission Extension Vehicle 1 successfully docked with the Inelsat 901 satellite uh, just outside a geosynchronous orbit, uh, starting a five year or more life extension service for, for the Inelsat 901. The Inelsat 901 satellite was actually launched back in 2001, so it's over 19 years old at the time we docked to it. Uh, it had been operating in geo orbit up until uh, about December of last year. Uh, it had entered inclined orbit operations starting in 2018, so it had about a 1.7 degree inclination by the time we docked to it. Um, it had, had it completed that mission, so it was successfully operating, uh, you know, in, in geo orbit. Uh, they raised the orbit up to the graveyard to intentionally uh, rendezvous and, and dock with our Mission Extension Vehicle 1. And our Mission Extension Vehicle 1, it launched in October of last year, uh, used electric propulsion to raise its orbit out to GEO, arrived out uh, in the GEO graveyard orbit in uh, late January of this year, uh, where it began the rendezvous mission with the 901 satellite. So over the period of a, of a few weeks, we rendezvoused and successfully docked to the uh, Inelsat 901 satellite. Inelsat 901, of course, being launched 19 years ago, wasn't designed, didn't have features designed to be docked to. Uh, so we were able to take advantage of existing features on the spacecraft to successfully capture it. Uh, once we docked to it, we, uh, we drifted it to a, towards its new uh, orbital location, uh, which is over the Atlantic Ocean region. And we also reduced the inclination. So as I mentioned, it had about 1.7 degrees of inclination. We brought that back down to zero. Uh, and in April of this year, we put it back into service and Inelsat transferred over 30 customers onto that satellite. And it's been operational uh, since that time. I uh, was very happy with that service. Um, so, so very excited about that. Uh, we launched our mission extension vehicle number two just a few weeks ago. Uh, it's beginning its uh, long journey out to geosynchronous orbit. 
Uh, this time, rather than docking out in the geograveyard orbit, since we've demonstrated the capability successfully in, in all, of our, all of our various procedures and contingencies, uh, this time we're going to be docking to them directly in the geo orbit. They will maintain service throughout the docking. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Should be happening in the February timeframe of next year. So, you know, what does this mean for space sustainability? I think, I think really we've demonstrated the fundamentals of satellite servicing. Um, it shows that servicing can be successfully used safely to extend the lives of satellites and, and thereby reduce the number of satellites we need to ultimately launch. Um, I think it's really paving the way for even greater servicing capabilities that will enable us to extend the lives of satellites. Again, having to launch, you know, less objects in space to achieve the same capabilities or attain totally new capabilities as well that will all support sustainability. Well, thanks a lot. And, uh, you know, thanks for managing to not uh, create more debris. Uh, as people kept worrying that you would, uh, you, you pulled it off well. And uh, as you said, I think it's a demonstration that this technology has, um, has a future. Um, Diane, you're in the position of having to try to turn all of these new innovations and developments into policy. Um, what's life like now at uh, commerce as you try to do that and and what's your own vision for uh, how we're uh, how we're doing at this point in uh, 2020 well I uh, I think that we've made a lot of progress I, I, to, to answer the question that sort of drives this panel and I think uh, what I've like to do is first address the three um, initiatives that Natalia brought up with regard to LTS and, and relate them to the work of our office, the Office of Space Commerce, but also the Department of Commerce at large. So for instance, for implementation, we're very, uh, very much involved in working to uh, working with the directives at Space Policy Directive 3 um, and all the tasks that it's given to us, but also to the interagency. Um, and and this this brings us right into you know dealing with the good work of Leo Labs. When we when we talk about SPD three, we talk about an open architecture data repository, but we also talk about leveraging commercial capabilities. And I think Leo Labs is an an excellent uh, poster child and role model for, for how that can develop. I, I think, you know, something that uh, Dan left out when talking about some of the really innovative work of Leo Labs is, is the role of Leo Labs in some of the regulatory processes down in New Zealand. And I think that's something that this particular group would, um, if, if they don't know about it, they should know about it because there is um, an element of, of compliance with the uh, regulations that Leo Labs is helping that government work with. And I I think that's incredibly innovative and something that we, we were paying attention to. Um, then another, the, the second thing that Natalia brought up was capacity building. And, and certainly my office is very involved in, in outreach. Um, we work with industry, we work with all, branch, uh, all parts of the executive branch and, and really the, the entire government. And we put on summits, we, we, we are known as conveners. In fact, recently we, we were um, happy to see the results of the National Academy of Public Administration study on space traffic management. And one of the things that was brought out in this report was that our, our office has proven itself to be constructive conveners and collaborators. And I, I think that this, this is part of capacity building for sure. And the last initiative was dealing with emerging challenges. And I, I would say that that relates very much to the work that um, MEV represents this, this kind of work, um, operations like this, that challenge the traditional way that, um, first of all, how we deal with um, the life cycle of a mission, but also how we even deal with the, the, the role of government in providing space flight safety support, um, what different kinds of analytics provided by companies like Leo Labs, but, but others as well. And how do we, um, how do we serve this uh, dynamic environment that is, that is changing <laughs> really on a weekly basis? And so we're, we're doing all of that um, while we're advocating for industry and the executive branch, but we're not leaving it at the executive branch. I mentioned before that we're looking at things in a whole of government way, and we are, and I think a very good example of that is, is the interagency working group that my office uh, has chaired um, with regard to commercial orbital debris, and that's been 
been constructive. I, I know that there, um, actually Dan was on a, in, in an event that we held about a week and a half ago, and I'm sure that there are others in the audience that are aware of this, and this is an effort for our office to make sure that everybody is um, in the discussion, everybody that's uh, from the regulator standpoint, from the policymaker standpoint, and from those that will be um, following those regulations when they ultimately get promulgated. So I think these are all really positive developments. I will say that um, although the whole pandemic situation has changed the way that we um, interact with one another and the way we do business, I think it's really given us a sense of what we have to do. We have to draw upon one another and we have to stay connected because it's, it's um, at least for my office, it's meant that this has been an incredibly productive and constructive time. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And, and, you know, to allow you to sort of move us into the middle of our discussion, um, you've got a lot of expertise in the area of space traffic management. You've been something of a champion of that discussion. Uh, and without, of course, committing the U.S. government or the Department of Congress or Commerce or anyone else, um, what's your sense of where the gaps are now uh, in terms of the next steps we need to take to, uh, uh, to create a, a predictable environment in, uh, in Earth orbit? First of all, I, I think that um, predictable now might not necessarily mean it's gonna be predictable five years from now or even five months from now. So I think that we need to um, be aware that the need for uh, agility and, and nimble responsiveness in dealing with the space environment. So I think that that's, Number one, I think we're at a point right now where um, virtually everybody who is working in space is aware of the fact that we have a situation that must not be kicked down the road that we must deal with, that there are increasing numbers of conjunctions. I mean, Dan mentioned one that was, you know, two derelict objects that almost, you know, came be the came within a frightening, frighteningly close uh, distance from one another back in February of this year. And, and they would have slipped through the uh, processes that are currently in place because they, those are too inactive, uh, their debris. And so the, the H, you know, CSPOC would not have reported out on that. And so that's, that's very concerning. So what do we need right now? What is the biggest gap? The biggest gap is my office, which has moved out on virtually everything that we could work on in SPD3 without funding. We, we now need to We've all acknowledged that we have an issue. We have all acknowledged that, that you know, there's, there's work that has been done and that will continue to be done, but it requires some commitment from Congress. We need, we need funding to go forward. And I think that um, that is important now. I don't think, I think it's, it's unrealistic to think that we're going to create something now that's going to address all problems forever and ever, amen. But I think what we can do is create something that is, again, ag agile and responsive and incorporates the, the, the best things that come bubbling up from the academic and research communities and also the commercial communities and is able to leverage those in a, in a, in a system that is constantly bettering itself and self-improving. Uh, sort of a constantly um, dynamic, uh, dynamic system for sure. Correct. Uh, yes. You know, it'd be nice, I think, now for us to turn to a few questions from uh, participants. And, and the first one I'd like to uh, deal with uh, goes to you, Natalie, uh, um, and, and his background, last year's Space Sustainability Summit, 48% uh, of the participants indicated uh, that, um, that the United Nations would be a logical place to discuss many of the space sustainability issues. The question is, do you think the General Assembly this year, without a report from Copios, will take up any major space issue? Well, uh, thank you for, for that question. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's, it's clear. I mean, the, you know, the substantive work is not done at the General Assembly. The substantive work is done at COPUOS in Vienna and its uh, committees and uh, other sub bodies like the working groups. So uh, most certainly uh, the, the COPUOS and, and uh, its sub bodies will get the mandate this year from the General Assembly to pursue its work. So uh, it's really, I mean, apart from uh, as chair of the scientific and technical subcommittee, I'm a bit worried that we cannot uh, meet uh, next year physically in Vienna. I mean, 
that all delegations cannot travel to Vienna. Uh, and in this respect, uh, what we have experienced this year is that some countries may be uh, reluctant to uh, discuss substantive uh, issues uh, or to take political decisions if they cannot be physically in the room. So uh, that is... Um, as I see it, one of, of, of my cons concern for, for the sessions uh, planned next year, but as to the mandate given by the General Assembly, uh, that there I'm not too much concerned. I, I believe COPOS will get its mandate. I'm more uh, concerned that member states will agree to work on the substance and will be flexible enough to make progress and to find consensus. Thank you, Natalie. Um Another question that is uh, being uh, submitted by uh, participants uh, really <clears throat> uh, concerns the, um, the question for, uh, really it's a question for Joe Anderson about how you mitigate the risk of complications when docking at the GEO uh, rather than um, um, say a graveyard um, um, at uh, altitude, or, or do you in fact have no choice? Well, um, yeah, let me address that. So the image over my head here is from MEV-1 as it was approaching the, the Inelsat 901 satellite. That image is from about uh, 80 meters or so uh, behind the client vehicle as we we're approaching it. Um, and I'll say we actually, uh, on this first demonstration, both Inelsat and Space Logistics together decided to do this initial docking out in the graveyard orbit. We were under no obligation to do that, but out of a, you know, a, a extra, extra you know, risk mitigation, we decided this very first time it would be prudent to do that. And in the process, we actually did multiple approaches to the 901 satellite over many days. And through that process, we, we demonstrated all of our operating procedures, we calibrated sensors, we, we made sure that you know, our modeling on the ground matches what's happening in orbit. Um, and, and all of our various levels of safety systems that we have in place were, were functioning and, and working. And so through that process, we validated that we have these multi, this multi-layer of safety systems built in that, that uh, adequately protect us and we feel enables us to do these missions safely in the GEO orbit. So it's not that we'll be doing anything, anything different uh, when we go to GEO, we'll actually be building off what we did in the, in the GEO graveyard orbit. Um, so we believe that we have adequately uh, addressed any, any, any of those risks. Are there any plans for an MEV-3? Uh, right now, uh, Space Logistics does not have plans for an MEV-3. We do have some customers we're talking to uh, that are, are perhaps interested in owning an MEV to manage within their fleets. Uh, but Space Logistics is currently working on our next generation system, which consists of uh, a, a mission robotic vehicle and mission extension pods. Uh, so there's small propulsion augmentation devices that can be installed on on existing satellites in GEO to extend their life. Um, so that's our next generation system. We're developing that uh, in partnership with DARPA who's supplying the robotic arms uh, for that mission. Uh, so that's, good. that's really our focus for servicing going forward and it really drives us into the, the next generation of capabilities for satellite uh, servicing in sustainability. Well, thank you. Again, uh, there's a question for you. Um, about accuracy. Uh, to what extent, Dan, do you think you've got uh, a management of false positives, in particular false alarms? Yeah, and you know that's a really important question, especially when it comes to uh, collision avoidance. So, you know, Diane had mentioned earlier that there were a number of these derelict on derelict uh, conjunctions going on, and you know, I want to point out that um, this isn't something that just started happening. This has actually been going on in the space environment for a while. It's just been unreported. Uh, there's been a focus on only the active satellites and anything that might collide with the active satellites. But you know, the guidelines are that uh, after the end of mission, a satellite can stay mm -hmm. in orbit for 25 years. So that actually means there's a significant number of payloads in addition to the debris that is up there and might collide with other things, might turn into um, smaller pieces of debris. Uh, so 
Um, you know, this is a situation that we need to make sure it doesn't continue to grow. And also it's a situation where the impact of a, a collision is quite dramatic. You know, in an instant, you can have 10%, 50% more debris in LEO. And we need to make sure that uh, that doesn't happen. So, um, you know, when it comes to accuracy and, and collision avoidance, that's an, an incredible topic because if you're not very accurate with the tracking solutions, you end up with a whole lot of false positives. And then if you're a satellite operator, you end up in a really tough situation that either you can spend all day, every day maneuvering to avoid every possible collision, um, or you can kind of shut your eyes and just, you know, hope for the best and ignore it all. And neither one uh, is a good approach. So, uh, you know, when we focus on tracking, we're really focusing on making sure we're tracking a satellite or a piece of debris to better than 100 meters. Uh, and that really enables us to give satellite operators a, a good feel for, is this upcoming conjunction high risk? Uh, do I need to move the satellite? Or is it one that I can, I can safely ignore? And um, along with that accuracy, I'd say maybe what's even more important is transparency. And specifically, letting the operator know uh, how well is that object, is that piece of debris being tracked. No data is perfect. Nobody can promise perfect data, but we can at least promise a really good assessment of how accurate it is. And so we bake transparency into our services uh, from the beginning. Well, you know, I think as we transition to looking at gaps, uh, we can actually pick up a number of the themes that are showing up in um, in questions, uh, it would appear at, at the current time as if uh, some of the gaps in space sustainability center around um, a, a, a lack of space traffic management consensus around the world, uh, an uncertainty about the technologies and the applications of active uh, de debris removal, uh, and, and standardization to what extent uh, do you cripple innovation by standardizing things well enough so that you don't have to invent new approach methods for every, uh, every object that you're, um, you're approaching? Uh, let's start off maybe um, uh, with you, Dan, talking about uh, your vision of how we fill these gaps. Yeah, oh, a very important topic. And, you know, is this, um, this, this new space revolution, this business revolution is moving forward. One thing we can be very certain of is there's just going to continue to be a lot of change. You know, it's, in, it's a lot of new launch vehicles and launch locations. It's a lot more advanced capability. So MEV-1, MEV-2 are great examples of extremely capable, innovative new satellites. Uh, and just in larger fleets, too. You know, so with SpaceX's Starlink constellation, it's the largest fleet of satellites we've ever seen. And I think um, you know, 2020 is shown to be a tipping point this is all gonna keep going. So, uh, you know, one big gap that we saw in the market is this lack of data, just understanding what is going on, space, on in space and keeping a very close eye on everything that's going on. Basically, uh, you know, accountability and deterrence really start with making space transparent, making sure there's no, there's no place where activities can occur that won't be reported on. And so that's a big part of why we're building out this global radar network to be able to report on satellites, on debris, uh, very frequently, many times per day. Um, you know, the other big thing uh, that I see that's missing, at least in the U.S., has been a regulatory agency uh, to take the lead on really establishing the new norms and establishing what it means to be a safe operator uh, in space. And um, the, I know the NAPA study was mentioned a little bit earlier, and I just want to uh, foot stomp that one. I think that's a very critical report, and it really lays the groundwork for moving forwards and, um, and making sure we, we do have a regulator. And I think the Department of Commerce is, is very well suited for that purpose uh, to take that lead. And it's really taking um, regulation from being kind of a pre-launch licensing activity and turning it into an ongoing thing that follows the entire life cycle of satellites uh, and satellite fleets. So I was really happy to see that um, that report come out. And, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, in the future, the, the Department of Commerce is going to be given the, the funding and the mandate uh, to, to run forward with that mission. 
You know, last year's uh, panelists uh, placed the, um, uh, a lot of importance on satellite operators revealing the position of their satellites, that publicly, uh, publicly uh, publishing that information. Uh, how, would, how would you integrate with that kind of published information uh, verification, um, confirmation, uh, how, how would that affect your business? Yeah, and actually the, the new space community by and large has been pretty good about that, getting um, satellite positions out there. Um, one of the ways that we're actually doing it right now is satellite operators uh, send us, some of the satellite operators send us their ephemerides, uh, so where their satellite's <laughs> going to be, including maneuvers, and we use that to actively look for conjunctions and screen conjunctions. Uh, and that's absolutely critical because um, without knowledge of where the maneuvers are going to happen, where the satellites are going to be, you don't, um, you don't have accurate uh, collision avoidance. Uh, and along with that, um, we're able to uh, screen one satellite operator's ephemeris against another. So basically, if you're planning some maneuvers and another person planning some maneuvers, uh, those can get cross-checked uh, against each other. And I think what this really points to is the space industry is rapidly adopting modern computing architectures. So we're able to take these services. So the computer systems, um, cloud-based systems that are flying one satellite constellation can get plugged into our cloud-based uh, um, software platform and link up to others and exchange all of this information in real time. This is no longer a process or a computing architecture where you know, it takes eight hours, 12 hours, uh, to get an answer. There's manual steps involved. Um, the space industry is moving towards a fully automated um, architecture, and that's actually a very recent development. Uh, that that uh, The space industry was kind of slow to, to uh, make that change, but we're really now leveraging a lot of the good work that's been done by social media platforms, online mapping platforms. They've all tackled the big data problem, and it's coming to space and frankly, it really takes down the barriers to doing the, the sorts of communications and safety of flight uh, systems uh, that you were, you were talking about. Well, thank you. And, and now maybe let's shift to Natalie. Um, one of the gaps obviously that exists is that we have a, a, a very solid set of uh, long-term sustainability guidelines and now we need implementation. And there's been some talk of actually creating a, a, a bureau, sort of a, a steering committee within uh, Copios to, to follow that implementation. How, how likely do you think that is? How important is it to reducing the gaps? Well, thank you, Michael, for this question. Uh, well, I mean, in, indeed, uh, the, so Copios itself decided to uh, establish a new working group, which should uh, as uh, one among a different uh, task, uh, help in the implementation of the 21 guidelines. So it is certainly uh, a, a very important task of this new working group, which will be hopefully um, getting, work, uh, getting to work uh, next year. Um, but suddenly, I mean, the guidelines, they are available to, uh, to I mean, they're publicly available, um, thankfully, and the old space operators can start uh, um, implementing them. Uh, so I, I would really um, look, I mean, at this, at this uh, uh, in a way that the, it, it is a common effort uh, by all space actors, and the government shall be the driving force uh, and work together at multilateral level. So hopefully we'll make progress uh, next year on this. But as, as I was uh, saying before, uh, it's very difficult to get consensus among all those uh, spacefaring nations which are member of COPWAS because they have different views. Uh, so it's, I, I, I really believe that the, the coordination uh, and the collaboration at all level is very important in the implementation or to foster the implementation uh, of those guidelines. So in Italy, last year's uh, participants, um, over 50% felt that conversations among like-minded states and participants in space activity 
uh, would likely be the most productive in creating new norms, in part because they were concerned that uh, consensus in a body that's approaching 100 members is extremely difficult to obtain. Uh, how would you see integrating this conversation among parts of the world community with this larger conversation that you're a part of that includes the members of Copio? Yeah, well, th thank you, because I think it's, it's a very good point and it's a trend that we can see indeed that uh, there are a group of states working together. And I think it, it's, it is very good. But in the end, all, all space actors, they are driving on the same highways up there. So we really need to, talk, to work all together with all space actors. Uh, and a set of uh, standards uh, which uh, or guidelines or norms developed by uh, a, a group of countries may not be agreeable to another group of countries. So that's why I'm saying uh, at state level, it's very important that all state, all state work together at multilateral level, global multilateral level. So that is at COP was. Well, thank you. And, and now I think maybe uh, turn to um, uh, turn to Joe, um, and one of the gaps that was pointed out by last year's participants was the problem of delay and deorbiting derelicts. Uh, to what extent could your technology be used to actually assist in deorbiting a derelict satellite rather than just um, um, uh, refueling it or getting it ready to um, serve again? <clears throat> sure. Um, absolutely. And so it's sort of two different, uh, you know, regimes there to talk about, of course, one, one out at GEO where we today don't actually deorbit satellites because they're just physics too far away to make that practical. So we actually push them out further in what we call the graveyard orbit. So certainly, you know, today's capabilities, our MEV is designed to do that. We've demonstrated that precisely, you know, that capability um, for satellites that have the features that an MEV docks with. Um, but certainly it is also demonstrating the basic capabilities that could be applied in any orbit. Uh, so, so that we could take that same, same basic rendezvous uh, and, and, and approach capabilities to, to capture satellites and deorbit them. Our next generation system uses robotics instead of this uh, specialized uh, docking mechanism that the MEV has. And so with robotic systems, you're much more uh, flexible to capture other types of satellites. Um, so with that capability, certainly in low Earth orbits, you would have the capability to grapple satellites and, and truly deorbit them. Um, so certainly the technologies we're doing today are, are directly applicable to that. There's still some incremental uh, steps to go, I think, to, to fully implement it, but it's very, very near term uh, possible to do that and implement those, those solutions. And, and there are companies out there today that are looking to do that in low Earth orbit. That is, you know, their primary mission is to do that type of mission. So, it, so that's very near term possibility. Mike, you're Did still- you run any uh, challenges as you, uh, as you planned your mission that it could have been uh, avoided with a, a more structured space traffic management uh, system or uh, were you able to solve most of your problems uh, independently? Um, well, certainly from a, a licensing perspective, uh, you know, we have several agencies we need to inter interact with. Um, so it'd be, be nice if we had a more consolidated group for that. But from a space traffic management, um, you know, out at GEO, we don't have, you know, quite the, the same situation that you have in the low Earth orbits. It's a much more... Um, I don't know, coordinated is not the right word here, but uh, everything's kind of moving in the same direction. So it's a little bit of a simpler situation in terms of managing uh, debris and managing uh, around other objects out in the geo orbit. Uh, a lot more space out there. It's not quite as congested, of course, as, as LEO and MEO orbits as well. So we really did not encounter uh, too many issues. Now, one of the challenges we did encounter is uh, doing this first mission out in the graveyard orbit is we're actually drifting relative to the Earth, right? So we're drifting across the arc, well, behind uh, other geocommunication satellites. So we had to always be maintaining uh, assurance that we were not causing interference uh, with those communication channels of satellites we would be drifting past. 
So, you know, one of the things that will actually make it simpler at the geo orbit is the fact that we won't have that constraint that, uh, you know, watching at what time we're, we're communicating with our spacecraft as we're doing the approach. So any plans to eventually try to handle the great gridlock in the sky in polar orbit? <laughs> uh, today we don't have any plans. Uh, certainly, you know, it's, it's on our roadmap uh, for developing the capabilities and, and working in the, the LEOs and GEOs and other, other orbits. The, the challenge we're facing there is we're a commercial company. We're, we're doing this, you know, as a, as a service. And so we need paying customers. And today there just isn't the economic incentive for us to go to those orbits. So that's really one of the real challenges that I think we face and in, in one of the big gaps that we're looking at here between, you know, the desires of, of you know, uh, active debris removal and, and long-term space sustainability and the economic realities of commercial businesses. Uh, trying to to implement those things. So it's one of the challenges that we face, I think, in the industry for the long term. So looking at the questions, uh, there's a question uh, for all of the panelists, and we'll maybe uh, keep you uh, on here for uh, for a minute. But um, what real progress have you seen in space sustainability in the last year? What what uh, advancements or activities uh, drive your optimism that we're making some progress? So, Joe? Yeah, so I'll start, I guess. Um, didn't know if that was directed to me or to the, the whole panel. Uh, so, you know, I think the two key things, I think the, you know, one of the keys, of course, is knowledge. And, and so things like Dan is doing and, and other businesses like his, increasing our knowledge of, of what's truly happening in space. I think that's a, been a big step forward, continues to grow and improve. Uh, of course, I think MEV uh, is another indicator of a, of a path forward to help with sustainability. Uh, so I think those to me are, are two key things uh, that have been happening. Great. How about you, Dan? What do you see? Yeah, you know, two things really come to mind. Um, to me, one of the, uh, the the big issues in LEO is the large amount of debris and specifically the untracked debris population. You know, so um, the numbers are quite amazing. There's, uh, there's about 14,000, maybe 15,000 objects tracked in LEO today. Um, a significant, the majority of that's debris. Um, but there's actually 20 times more stuff that's smaller, down to two centimeters in size. So uh, roughly 250,000 objects. They're not tracked today. So a lot of the space sustainability uh, discussion is really focused on 5% of the risk, the, the large stuff. And one of the big things we've been doing, when we founded the company to track the two centimeter debris. And so when we built the Kiwi Space Radar, that was the first proof point of the radar technology that we launched the company around to track the small debris. And we're now rolling out more copies of it ar around the world. So um, I'm really excited um, to see the, the next radar, the Costa Rica radar, uh, come online and be able to track the two centimeter debris and, and get work all that information into space traffic safety. Um, the one other thing I wanted to bring up is um, we had an, an interesting, or we have uh, an interesting ongoing work with the New Zealand Space Agency. They're now using the sustainability and uh, space regulatory uh, platform. And I think this is the first example of a regulator uh, really keeping an eye on what's actually occurring in space. So they're using real-time data coming off of uh, our radar network to watch all of the satellites that have been launched out of New Zealand and understand uh, their compliance and understand their activities in space. Uh, and, and that's a really important shift. You know, that's a shift from only looking at pre-launch licensing activities to keeping an eye on the activities in space. And I think that's going to be a really important um, direction uh, to keep going with because we're going to see a lot of innovative new activities. We're going to see certain orbits get more crowded than others. And that's gonna require updating the best practices and the regulations. And all of those are gonna be best if they're really based on the realities, if they're based on the data about what's actually occurring in space. So, so I was really happy to, to get started with that um, uh, space sustainability and regulatory platform. 
And I'm hopeful we, we will see a lot of similar activities um, around the world over the coming year. Well, Diane, uh, you've got uh, a government uh, seat to look at some of these issues. So where, where do you see the progress uh, in the last, uh, last year? Well, I think that there have been more focused conversations, but also more focused operations. I think we're seeing that in things like the MEV and also uh, Leah Labs, but also there's something called SACT, which I know Leah Labs was a, has had a, a pretty ro a big role in. That's the Sprint Advanced Concept Training, and it's, it's a, a training initiative that's uh, put on by DOD, but we've actually, my office has also co-sponsored this, and it involves uh, more and more of the commercial sector, and, and I think there's been a lot of progress in understanding just uh, how different scenarios can be um, responded to, how different capabilities, different observational capabilities, um, and then also different analytic capabilities can factor into making um, the space environment, uh, uh, making better predictions and, and make more actionable information and, and better decision making ultimately. And I think, you know, that's also um, revealing some of the things that really require some research right about now. We need to start working on how to fuse some of this data and that, that implicates some of the standards work that you talked about before. And I, I just want to make the observation that um, standards don't have to be um, limiting or encumbering on industry. Instead, in the U.S., um, industry is required to make input into uh, standards development. But standards are great because they're grounded in operations and there's much more progress in the standards development with regard to our sector. And right now there is even in uh, ISO, there is a, a standard that's been proposed, I believe it, the proposal has been accepted for space traffic coordination and management. So that, that's, that's a big development I, I, I think needs to be noted. Um, and you know, this understanding about how the data works together and the kinds of things that are coming out from the SACT um, uh, events is also um, something that we're taking into this first phase of our open architecture data repository. So we've been working with the NOAA Big Data Project in much the same way that Dan was mentioning that this, these are really big data uh, challenges, not really um, specific to space, but, but they have cropped up in a, a number of different contexts. And we're starting to um, understand that some of the, the things that have been sussed out in other contexts will be very useful to us in, in space and putting these things together. So to that end, we've already got the Space Weather Prediction Center data in our big data project and say hello to my dog Gigi and uh, we're, we're working right now on incorporating re-entry data um, and um, other other data sets that are available to us and that we can um, put onto NOAA's big data project and respect the, the, the NOAA mission while doing so. So I think all of those things uh, really speak to great progress right now at least from our perspective. Hey, and Gigi agrees with you. She right? absolutely Excellent. Uh, Nathalie, um, from, from your vantage point in Europe, what kinds of issues are you seeing? I mean, Switzerland was early in talking about uh, an active debris uh, removal experiment. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on in Europe. Uh, what, what's giving you some sense of optimism about progress? Yeah, no, uh, thank you. I think it's, a, it's a, I'm very happy because I had uh, prepared a few examples from, from Europe, actually. So maybe the first, uh, uh, the first uh, element, I mean, the European Space Agency uh, established a new program on space saf safety uh, a year ago, I mean, at the Ministerial Council uh, uh, in November last year. Uh, and in this, in this uh, new program, you have several elements. Uh, uh, one ADR mission, uh, one uh, so called the Adrios, uh, the CRIM mission for automated uh, collision avoidance services, um, and also on space weather. So on several areas uh, pertaining to uh, improving uh, the sustainability of space activities, you'll have new missions uh, from uh, ESA's side. Uh, and by the way, so Switzerland is member state of ESA and is very much involved in the Adrios uh, ADR mission as uh, you was uh, you were mentioning uh, Michael so that's uh, I think and, and uh, I also uh, heard recently uh, uh, an example um, uh, progress um, you know, a close um, conjunction, conjunction between the satellites have brought the operators to get in contact to establish uh, 
um, channels of communication, uh, non-disclosure agreements, so that they can exchange more freely data in case a new uh, case of uh, uh, closed approach uh, uh, arrives, and so that they both can better react to avoid a collision. So. I think it's it's a uh, progress is being made by a collection of small steps by all actors, and obviously we see also the the new kind uh, of activities being developed by the private sector, uh, as we hear from Joe and, and Daniel, and. It's good to see the private sector arising in in the type of activity like on orbit servicing, like uh, SSA, like also uh, early warning uh, in case of poly of a, uh, risk of collision, uh, etc. So it's it's a whole new range of uh, tools which are now being available for space actors. Um, yeah, and, and certainly, I mean, since the adoption of the guidelines by COPWOS, awareness is is uh, is uh, increasing uh, at all levels, I would say, certainly among um, governments, but also uh, at the um, society level. And that's, I think it's it's very positive because we need to be, there need to be a better uh, awareness of the threats to the space environment. Um, and obviously capacity building exchange between um, at all levels, I would say, with the academia, among governments, with the private sector, uh, and the Secure World Foundation is a very important actor in this respect in organizing uh, events around the world to raise awareness in all regions. So I think it's, I see a lot of activity uh, and, and I think it's good to see them. Thank you. You know, keeping on the Europe focus for a moment, um, are there particular private sector initiatives going on in Europe related to active debris removal or uh, space situational awareness that uh, you would call to mind as uh, part of the European use of private sectors? Yeah, I mean, I recall, especially on SSA and, uh, I mean, the two examples you gave and uh, ADR, uh, I mostly recall uh, public funded projects. Uh, for instance, uh, on uh, there was a, a project by the European Union uh, to uh, for technology development um, on uh, ADR and SSA, uh, as you know, is, uh, is very, I would say is, is more, um, from operated or promoted from the government side uh, in, in Europe and both within the European Union and within the European Space Agency whose membership are different as, as you may know. Right. Uh, ESA, uh, the European Space Agency, has talked a lot about its interest in eventually deorbiting Envisat. Is there any progress being made in that, uh, in that direction? Well, so as I was saying, um, uh, ESA is putting in place a program to uh, um, an ADR mission, uh, which is not directed at NPSAT. So I think uh, before getting the big piece, they try with smaller piece. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. It, uh, um, I think there's been a lot of um, uh, questions popping in about uh, standards actually. and. And so uh, this could be an interesting topic to, to deal with. And maybe we'll, uh, we'll jump back to um, uh, Dan, first of all, on this. Uh, the concern that seems to be in the question panel is how mandatory would standards be and uh, how important are they to uh, being able to, um, uh, to provide data about the satellites in orbit, and then eventually we'll turn to Joe about uh, what it would mean to uh, uh, actually service them on orbit. So, Dan? Yeah, so, you know, so I think um, standards actually fit in this uh, kind of broader progression uh, where I think we, in the best case, like to start with best practices, uh, codify the, the ones that work well into standards, and then, if necessary, uh, move those into regulations. Uh, and I think there's been a, a lot of good work on the standard side and a lot of good discussion around 
uh, the, regula the regulations in the regulatory side. But um, I would actually argue that uh, I think the work may have gone about as far as it can without data. And, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion is kind of is centered around um, kind of hypotheticals and deciding, you know, what um, what may happen. And, uh, you know, I think we really want to ground that in what actually is happening. And then also look at the solutions. And there's a lot of companies that are trying new capabilities on orbit. They're trying new operational procedures. And I really hope we can bring a lot of that um, through to forums like these. Uh, out into the public discussion and try to grab a hold of what space traffic management uh, or kind of satellite management capabilities uh, are being used right now and really being uh, brought to bear uh, on the problem. So, you know, I think the, the topic of standards is, is an important one, um, but frankly, I think just focusing on what's working and what's occurring in space, kind of where the risks are, where the risks aren't, will actually bring a lot of the change that's desired. You know, I have to believe that um, a lot of the satellite operators we know and we talk with, they listen to these public discussions and they automatically start engineering away the risks um, that are being highlighted, that are being discussed. So I think um, regulatory bodies like Department of Commerce uh, and others, they have a lot of power by just driving the public discussion and focusing it on the critical issues. Uh, and so that's, uh, so hopefully all of that leads, leads to good standards, leads to good regulations. But you know, as a follow up, um, uh, to convert data into information, you need to aggregate it and analyze it. So where should that happen? Um, you know, it, by what you're saying, no one company is going to have a complete monopoly on that information. Mm -hmm. So uh, who, who should bring that together? Uh, what kind of who should be used. Yeah, you know, you, you've touched on a really interesting point that that's actually changed a lot in the last few years. And, and I don't think it's, it's really been noticed. So in the past, the notion was kind of, you had, you had radars, or you had telescopes, and you got this kind of big pile of data, and then, which they really meant measurements. Um, and then you had to piece together this, this software processing system, ultimately turn that into alerts and reports uh, and the like. And then eventually, you know, somebody would get that and decide how to respond, to decide what to do uh, about it. And unfortunately, it put too much emphasis on kind of the early collection and generation of the data and not enough on the analysis and the response and what needs to be done. Um, what's really shifted now, what the commercial SSA industry is doing is they're saying data is no longer really the measurements. Data is that kind of end piece that somebody can act upon, that a satellite operator can act upon or a regulator or the insurance industry can act upon. It's a collision report or it's a, a maneuver alert or it's a um, report about a newly launched uh, batch of rideshare uh, satellites. So companies like Leo Labs are taking, going all the way from the sensor, from the radar and the telescope, all the way to actionable information. And they're making that happen in real time. And so that actually means these um, you know, defense organizations, regulators, satellite operators, they can actually get the situation in space or around their satellite and react to it. They don't have to become radar experts. They don't have to become software, you know, signal processing experts. That's kind of handled. And that's something that's never been, uh, never been available before. So you know, I would really argue that the, the data integration level has shifted and it's not measurements anymore. It's actually things like conjunction data messages, an industry standard. So, you know, Leo Labs produces those, um, the, the US uh, Space Command produces those, and it's something that satellite operators are already ingesting. And so I would actually argue that we need to focus on that really kind of high level data analytics and integrate at that point. It just makes a lot more logical sense and it ultimately makes all these space actors a lot more effective. Thank you. Uh, Joe, um, to some extent, uh, your uh, MEV missions have shown that you can get something done even in a world without standards. As you said, yeah. the target had, had, was a, a totally uncooperative uh, um, uh, piece, of, piece of hardware. I, to what extent do you see standards becoming a part of the issue of the of the future of on-orbit servicing, um, are they necessary? What's 
What's your observation from experience now? Uh, so, yeah, currently we probably, we feel they're probably 80% of the, the satellites in GEO are addressable uh, with, with the technology that we have for, for capturing satellites using the liquid Apogee engine in their launch adapter ring. Um, but that's not the way forward, right? That's not the way to continue doing things. And I do believe standards play a very important role in that future for satellite servicing. Um, it, it, is a, it is a difficult question though, how to, how to do standards in this area, right? So, so standards will help us, help us grow the market. It'll help us grow the serviceability and sustainability of space. Uh, but on the other hand, if standards aren't done right, they can also inhibit innovation. So it's finding the way to do these standards in the right way that, you know, enable the market to grow, enable the capabilities to grow, to, to enable sustainability uh, while not diminishing that, that innovation. So that's the real trick. I do think there are a couple of key areas that, that standards would help in the very near term, and, and those would be in the area of, of refueling interfaces for future spacecraft that after 2024, every new spacecraft, just from a commercial perspective, not a regulatory, shouldn't be mandated, right? That should have refueling valves on them. Uh, should have a, a power and data port, like a USB port on your, on your computer. And with those two basic interfaces, you can do so much and extend the capability of your satellites and, and reduce risks tremendously by having those, those two key features. Um, so if we had standards so that every satellite manufacturer use those same interfaces, um, you know, it will greatly improve, you know, that sustainability picture. But trying to figure out how to do those standards while not hindering innovation is, is going to be the challenge. Well, Diane, I probably if this were a physical conference, every eye in the room would be focused on you as a, as a regulator. Um, there's a lot of, um, of concern in the comments and in last year's discussions that if, reg if, if standards were incorporated in regulations, it becomes stifling, the whole innovation issue. Uh, what's your sense of what role a government and the private sector will play in uh, the standards discussion going forward? Well, first, Gigi's been very loud in reminding me that I need to address the international piece of things. She was very, very disturbed that I neglected to bring the international piece. So with regard to standards, let me first say that it's standards, the best standards, um, come from operations. They're, they're, they're grounded in practice, but they're also grounded in things that are truly happening. So they really do represent a bottom-up approach. And in determining standards, to make, make sure that these, these are standards that are going to be useful to the community, um, it's very important that industry have input. And, and this is one way to um, avoid having cumbersome standards that, that are either not achievable or not based on, that they're not underpinned by, by, by really well thought out technical analysis. Um, but in, in developing standards, one standards development doesn't necessarily um, cancel out another standards development. They can work, they can develop from the bottom up because they're coming out of different practices. And one of the wonderful things about our space economy is the ability for all of these innovations to percolate. And that's, that's one of the things that my office is very keenly aware of and really wants to support. So let me bring to your attention two, two pieces of this bottom up uh, operations based standards development approach. One, when you're talking about performance-based regulation, you can determine what the outcome is that you want to achieve and then use some sort of identifiable, replicable uh, standards or criterion to get there. And, it's, and you're not locked in on just one. So this is why I say being able to develop more than one way to skin the cat can be very useful for the community as it determines. And it fits right in with a light touch performance-based regulatory framework. Another thing that this kind of bottom-up approach does, um, while working on achieving this multilateral um, 
communication that Natalia addressed, when we have something that's, that's um, standards that are operationally based and, and replicable in this way and, and that are informed by the technical community, those are easily shareable with the international community. And that's something that you see in SPD3. You see that you know, some of the standards development work that the interagency is directed to um, engage in is to inform the international community going forward so that our activities aren't happening by themselves so that they're integratable and so that some of the th some of the challenges um, with regard to the analytics and the messaging and how you know what an operator needs to have in place in order to be even be able to take in the information that these things are are known and in a transparent way but they're known in an in international community thanks Thank you, John. Quieted now. Yeah. She feels much better. Thank you. Much better, and she was glad you wanted to skin the cat and not the dog. So that's correct. Uh, and this is why this dog. is that is my metaphor. I, I know where my bread is buttered. Right. Sounds great. Sounds great. The um, I, one interesting theme in the questions is the theme of uh, how. Uh, space situational awareness in particular uh, is treated when you happen to stumble on or discover military assets. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe we start right off the bat with, uh, with Dan and um, how complicating is it to your life that some of what you're going to see is stuff that some people don't want you to see? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of the, um, uh, kind of discussion in the in industry has focused on that in the past. Um, I actually have to say it's it's a little bit of a, a misdirection because, you know, the biggest challenge for space traffic safety and space sustainability is really the debris, is really the derelict satellites. So, you know, there are 14,000 closing on 15,000 objects in LEO being tracked today. Over 12,000, about 12,000 of those are debris, derelict satellites, pieces of debris, fragments of satellites. Um, the portion of, of objects that, you know, maybe military in nature is very small compared to that amount. And then on top of that, you add in small debris, the stuff down to two centimeters in size. And now rather than looking at 12,000 um, pieces of debris, you're actually looking at about 250,000 pieces of debris. That's the, the giant issue. Tracking those, avoiding collisions with those uh, is, is kind of mission number one. So I, you know, I'd have to say, we'll tackle that. Uh, we'll get that, we'll figure that out. And um, I really don't think we're gonna, we're gonna hit roadblocks um, with, you know, with the, the issue of military satellites. Well, Joe, uh, as you wander around the graveyard orbit and geo, you're going to see a few um, military assets. Um, what kinds of protocols do you need to have in place to deal with that? And then also maybe to recognize when one of those assets may be posing a hazard. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> in geo, we got a pretty good sense of, of where, where the assets are all located. Um, we, we don't need tremendous accuracy because most of these assets are all flying in the same direction, right? So, you know, real precision isn't necessary for us to safely drift by. Um, but we do have limitations in our licensing. We have limitations, especially on our non-Earth imaging. So our MEV does have uh, imagers on board that are used to do the rendezvous. The, the picture behind me here is one of those images. And, you know, we do have restrictions about things that we can image um, and, and what we can do with those, with those images. Uh, so, so there are some restrictions there. Um, now with our system, I, I mean, these aren't uh, big telescopes. I mean, that image was taken from, from 80 meters away, right? We, we really can't see much. We can't really resolve images with our spacecraft, you know, beyond a, a few kilometers. Um, so it's not really a risk to, you know, the national defense type of, of spacecraft because of that. Um, but, but it exists, it's out there. And, and I think one of the things that, you know, in the long term, we're going to have to get used to as a nation and our national defense and, and others is that, you know, these systems are going to be, be growing and, you know, and, and there's going to be more and more of them. They're not going to all be based and licensed out of the U.S. And others are going to be able to image these satellites. And, you know, at space is a free place. 
right? Uh, it's it's like being in a in a on a public street with with a camera, and we're going to have to find a way, I think, uh, to to cope with that in the long term. So, uh, you know, as far as the military side, you talk, uh, Diane, about uh, interagency uh, work. Uh, is is DOD involved in those interagency discussions? Of course they are. Definitely. Absolutely. First of all, we work very, very closely with DOD with regard to the transition um, from the services that a the 18th has uh, tirelessly provided uh, despite the fact that it wasn't you know central to their primary mission for, for many years and so we work with them we have a, a liaison um, out at Vandenberg Air Force Base and he works well we all are working very closely with them to to work on these things so DOD is part of that but DOD is part of all of the interagency from from the international space cooperation through all discussions um, DOD is there and and certainly DOD has been a big part of the interagency discussion with regard to some of the um, remote sensing regulations. Our, our, we, we came up with a new and extremely um, innovative uh, final rule just a few short months ago. And, and that definitely involved uh, DOD to, to an, a, a very significant degree and still is for, for many of the, uh, the reasons that Joe just touched upon about the, the, uh, the availability of, of technologies elsewhere than in the US and what, what is the impact of, of this availability on the, the uh, IC and, and the security communities anywhere else in the world. So yes, DOD is part of it. We all are. At this point, you know, we're, we're, our equities, I think, are becoming, uh, they're, they're changing uh, in the interagency, and, and certainly there's an awareness of, of the uh, commercial equities in, in a, a much more profound way than there was, but they, they're, they're different. These equities are different, and we, we all need each other because we all come at things from, from different, different perspectives, and this is how you avoid groupthink because, you know, instead of trying to be all things to, to all entities at once, you, there are some very deep expertises within, and certainly DOD is part of that conversation. Great. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, yeah, and, and and Mike, oh, yes. Mike, I, I might add from, you know, the satellite operations perspective, <laughs> Um, interface with the DOD. We interface with the with the, the J Spock, C Spock in, in Colorado, right? We share our, our orbits with them so they know where we are, uh, but they're also sharing with us, right? So they're doing a lot of the conjunction analysis and, and they notify satellite operators around the world when these conjunctions happen. So it's a natural part of our standard operations for all of our spacecraft uh, to go through that. So, so there's a natural sharing that's already happening there. So the Defense Department is aware of where we are, and certainly if something's gonna become an issue, they, they would let us know. And if I could Thank add you. one yeah. other quick comment too. Um, you know, I think there is a very important notion of deterrence here as well. And it's not only deterrence for things like um, anti-satellite weapons tests, but also for just bad behavior that would lead to collisions or, or lead to satellite breakups. Uh, you know, and as Joe pointed out, there's more and more capabilities coming from more and more places uh, around the world. And I think it's really important that space becomes transparent, that all of these activities are reported on, all the sources of debris are reported on. Uh, and so there's a new level of accountability. So it just becomes untenable to create new debris or to take the risks that are going to substantially alter uh, the risk environment. Uh, and and that's actually a big shift. Space really hasn't been transparent in the past, but I, I think it's a critical element of making it sustainable. I have one comment to that, Mike, and that is, I, I like to think of it in terms of mutually assured benefit. I think that transparency puts us all on, on, on our best behavior or should. Well, you know, Natalie, that sort of sets uh, up the stage for uh, your impressions from Europe, because the firewall between defense policy and civil space policy has tended to be higher in Europe. Uh, what's your sense of the sensitivity of uh, the military establishments in Europe, particularly France, which seems to have the largest uh, military satellite uh, constellation, uh, to uh, some of the space situational awareness work that the civil agencies are attempting? Yeah, 
Well, thank you. Uh, well, I really don't want to uh, <laughs> to uh, um, to be too affirmative on on, on this. Uh, I suddenly see um, uh, not a divide, but I mean, it, it seems to be through that uh, SEC in Europe is rather in the hands of of, uh, of the military. Uh, especially, I mean, and France is one of those countries which uh, splits, um, but but it's not the only one in Europe, indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a. It, it's funny you say that because my impression here from Europe <laughs> is also it was that actually in the U.S. you had also quite a, a strong um, uh, um, hand, a hand from the military on on SAC. Although I, I'm aware of the discussion to move it to commerce, but it's, there is, uh, as we understand it, uh, still a, a very strong hand on, on the confidentiality and the classification uh, of data, uh, of SSA data. So, and I think it's, it is, it is uh, somehow true uh, in many countries. And, and this is certainly um, an element which uh, prevent uh, from making progress in uh, a more open and um, reliable SSA for all space uh, operators. Because obviously, if you hide, if you hide a part, uh, and a big part, 40-50% of the uh, orbit, orbital information uh, from the rest, and how, how precise can your evaluation uh, of the risk of the calculation of the orbits uh, be. So, I mean, it, it is certainly a, a domain where progress would be welcome, uh, and I believe it uh, in many countries. Uh, so, um, that, that is a really, as, as I see it, a challenge uh, for a better SEC uh, for all space actors. Well, thank you, Nathalie. And, and as we approach uh, the end of our time, we have about three minutes left. Uh, I'd, I'd like us to turn to a, a brief statement from each of you about what you consider to be the uh, greatest challenge to the future sustainability of space. And since, Nathalie, we have you on the screen, uh, maybe you could, you could start. <clears throat> Well, thank you. I think I'd, I'd be deviate a little bit from, from, from your question. And I'd like to emphasize, I just heard it uh, this morning from the head of the Space Safety Program of ESA. Uh, I think his words were, I mean, because he said the, the uh, increase uh, of debris in the LEO is, uh, is, um, uh, is extremely high. And, but... And that is because the compliance with the space debris mitigation guidelines is very low indeed. So we have the guidelines and uh, they are not enough implemented. So he said if they were implemented, there would be uh, the, the exponential trend would be stopped. So that's a good news. We should just have to implement the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. So Joe, what's your, uh, what's your take? The biggest challenge in space sustainability? Um, so I think the biggest challenge we face is a gap between the economics required to foster and grow the space economy and the economics of implementing, you know, the ideal solution for indefinite space sustainability, right? Any, any pressures you put on, on new businesses, commercial businesses, trying to, to grow that, that, that new business, that new economy, of course, constrains how fast they can grow. So to me, that's, that's the biggest challenge that we face. Okay, Dan? Yeah, I think the, um, uh, this revolution that's going on in the space industry is creating extremely rapid and uh, ex extremely positive changes and getting a lot of new satellites uh, up there. And I think uh, the biggest challenge we have is actually making sure uh, kind of every other aspect uh, of, of the industry and especially uh, space traffic safety norms and uh, in monitoring and compliance keep up uh, and we don't uh, get ourselves locked in uh, a very rigid uh, way of implementing say new norms or new regulations but instead are able to keep an eye on what's going on in space and adapt very rapidly 
so I think it's uh, it's kind of keeping abreast of what all the um, uh, the engineering firms in the private sector are doing. All that great rapid work uh, is it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a it's going to be a sprint that's going to go on for a while. And Diane, if you could wrap up with the minute we have left. Okay, well, I would say that for our office, the biggest challenge is funding. But for all of us, um, I would say that inaction is the biggest challenge. And that can come from either being overwhelmed, too many, too many uh, false positives, or also from uh, complacency. And so I would say that those would be, you know, one would be writ large in action, and the one that's most immediate to my office would be funding. And thank you so much thank for this opportunity. Thank you, Diane. And so we've come to the end of our panel. Um, I hope that uh, you carry away a certain amount of optimism about the possibilities and a certain sense of caution about over complacency.